Good evening, everybody. It's nice to see a standing room only meeting. Uh, welcome to our March 20th, 2023 Board of Education meeting. As always, before we begin, please take a second, take a look at your phones and make sure the ringers are on silent. Inevitably, we have one go off every meeting, but that's okay. Uh, after you do that, please join me for the Pledge of Allegiance. Thank you very much, everyone. Okay. The front, uh, row, have, the front row is better than all you get. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Way to represent. We have Mr. Lauterbach filling in as Secretary. Uh, Mr. Lauterbach, please take Here. Vice President Rausch. Here. Secretary Hatfield is absent. Uh, Treasurer Lauterbach. Member Blazy. Here. Member Ringel. Here. And before we on to our agenda I do have to appoint a special secretary uh, for items yeah we have to appoint one to the uh, so that I will appoint the water body special secretary okay consent point approval number 20 is a list employee leave request item 2.4 is a list of staff who have announced announced their resignation as well as the effective dates item 2.5 is approval of the school systems bill payment of the school systems bills in the amount of seven million seven hundred sixteen thousand one hundred twenty eight dollars item 2.6 is a list of uh, requests to pay legal fees and item 2.7 is the jewel set. and i will accept them for the consent agenda move to approve consent agenda items 2.1 through 2.7 second motion by mr roush uh, support by Ms. ringold any discussion regarding any of the items in the consent agenda Mr. Sherrill, can you provide us a little more clarity with the Jewel settlement? Sure. So that was a lawsuit that we participated in for the not later date. <coughs> I'll go to the mic. So we participated in against the Jewel Corporation for marketing their vape devices to minors. And so that has come to a conclusion for the portion of it. Um, <clears throat> because the judge has ruled in our favor and the settlement they want to get before the jewel, the smaller of the portion of the lawsuit may no longer exist. And so um, the settlement amount for us is $123,626 and it is to reimburse for expenses to do with vaping and it was based on your high school population and the number of high schools that you had. The lawsuit will continue to go on against Philip Morris and its mother company, Altria. And this may be the larger of the settlement, as you know, that it's a very large corporation, but it could go on for quite some time. But we'll continue to be in, uh, in that lawsuit as well. The payments for the vape uh, jewel settlement is four payments. You get 50% up front, and then um, the final payment is in 2026. So you get paid over time. Okay. Thank you. Okay, all in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? All right, motion carries. Thank you very much. <coughs> Next up, item three. These are our shining stars. Ms. Yes, getting rewired up here. Hear me, hopefully. Our first shining star for this month. Stand next to me for a very awkward moment while we talk about you in front of all these people. Amy joined the MPS team in 2018 as an office professional at the Carpenter Pre-Primary Center and remains currently in this position. Amy is an assistant from Ross Medical Education Center, but MPS, but in the child care prior to wants to continue to work with the children. 
Amy was nominated for a Shining Star by the MPS colleagues. Among their comments were the following. Amy is simply amazing. She is always willing to lend a helping hand. She has a friendly face and an encouraging voice. Time and time again, Amy goes out of her way to help anyone in need, from a middle school to a bell, for warm clothes to solve a five-year-old's latest crisis. <laughs> Amy is always there when we need her, and we need her a lot. Amy has always been friendly and is willing to help both her coworkers <clears throat> and any families with questions or concerns. She is someone who leaving space in the office for anyone needing help. Amy is an asset to the building. <coughs> Amy is the successful running of the pre-primary center. She is the teacher's second and third set of hands, willing to step up when needed, a voice of reason, and helps keep everyone on track and organized. Our building would not be as awesome as it is without Amy. Congratulations, Amy. Our second shining star is Sprite, if Sarah would join me as well. I'll read a little bit about Sarah as she comes up. Sarah's MPS journey began in 2018 when she was hired as a fourth grade teacher at Seabird Elementary. From there, Sarah began teaching at Northeast Middle School, and she remains in this position currently. Sarah earned her Master of Arts in Teaching Curriculum degree from the College of Education at Michigan State University. Sarah was nominated for her shining star by MPS and colleagues among their crew were the following. Mr. Wright goes above and beyond to help students in their pre-algebra class. Ms. remains calm and helps She is always willing to help students with their math skills. Sarah has a heart for students. She really knows how to connect with them and because she knows her students, she is able to differentiate learning experiences to meet their needs. She is equally as great with colleagues. She leads by an example. She is humble, collaborative, always willing to and as a team player. Congratulations, Sarah. All right, next on the list, we have item 3.2. This is an advanced learning program for students presentation. This will be by Jen Servos and Kara Stark. Good evening. Good evening. <laughs> My name is Kara Stark and I am the proud principal of Central Park Elementary. We are nearing the end of our first year of the implementation of the Advanced Learning Program for Students, also known as the ELPS program. As we look at the district's vision and continuous improvement goal, the ELPS has provided for students individual needs to be met and extend the learning within a safe and collaborative environment. representation from all six elementary schools. There are five grade levels represented, first through fifth grade, with about 100 students enrolled in the program. Tonight, I am excited that the teachers and students of this program have the opportunity to share this amazing things that they are doing within their classrooms and the program. I would now like to introduce you some of the phenomenal team members that make this program such a success. We have Jen Service, our elementary curriculum specialist, Wendy Winters, one of our consultants. Chelsea Sove, our assistant principal, is in the crowd. We have Sarah Cooper, our first grade teacher. Christina Wheel, our second grade teacher. Leanne Reel, our third grade teacher. And Melanie View, our fourth grade teacher. And Amanda Laddick, our fifth grade teacher. In addition, phenomenal students who are going to share their experience as well. So I'm going to let them take it away.
ALPS has been designed with the PYP framework as our guide. At its core, the primary program develops inquiring, knowledgeable, confident, and caring young people. The PYP empowers students to take ownership in their learning and helps develop future-ready skills to make a difference and thrive in a world that changes fast. In ALPS, grade-level subjects, content, and extensions are delivered through a transdisciplinary and conceptual approach to teaching and learning. The 21st century is an era of new dimensions, new openings, endless opportunities, and new world innovations. To flourish in this world, students need to be equipped with 21st century skills. The Advanced Learning Program for Students strives to build these skills. Did you know, according to recent reports published by both Dell Technologies and the Institute for the Future, 85% of the jobs that will exist in 10 years have not even been invented yet. These skills are critical as we work to prepare our students for the future. Learning is no longer the task of memorization, but rather critical thinking, problem solving, creativity, collaboration. Students need to be actively engaged in their learning and have opportunities to apply what they are learning to real world situations. Tonight, we are here, we will hear firsthand from our teachers and students in ALPS. So many exciting learning opportunities to share. Both teachers and students have embraced this new program, learning and growing together. First up, I would like to introduce Mrs. Wheel second grade ALPS teacher, and a few of her exciters. Good evening for having us tonight. I want to talk to you a little bit about the amazing writers that I have in my classroom. Um, <clears throat> excuse me, we have a new writing curriculum that we have adopted, and the students have used it and grown so much being offered to them. The writing that they do amazes me every day, and I want to share a few of those with you. Some of the writing that you'll hear is a personal narrative, an opinion, and a poetry piece. In second grade, we do publish um, for each unit of writing, so we've published by a traditional publishing where we printed and typed and all that. We did uh, just a, an opinion piece where they would sit in front of a screen like a TV show style. We're going to publish a poetry as a classroom, and then we'll also did publish in our, our class, uh, genre we will do. So first I'm going to ask, uh, ask Augie Litke to come up here and share his personal narrative. And the pictures are on the screen. The giant jump. The giant jump. One quite amazing but very snowy day, I was at Steamboat Springs, Colorado, and I was on the Why Not Ski Trail when I saw a jump that looked like it was a four-foot-tall poster. It was getting closer. One foot, eight inches. Lift off! I was in midair. I didn't know if I was going to land or not. Now I was about one foot from the ground when I lost control. I was about eight inches from the ground now. Anyway... My ski was going on my other ski. It felt like my feet were stuck together. I, I thought, I'm going to crash, but I pulled my ski away just in time. Crunch. I landed in the snow and made away. The end. I'm Augie, and one thing I like about the ELPS program is the advanced tests. They aren't too easy, easy and not too hard. My next student is Vivan, and Vivan is going to share his opinion piece. In second grade, we write our opinions about books that we read. Dear reader, in the book, Click Clack Moo, Cows That Type, Chronic, Cr Dorian Cronin, illustrated by Betsy Lewin, is a silly book because some 
us find our old typewriter and type stuff. For example, they type. Sarah Brown. The bar is very cold at night. We'd like some electric blankets. Sincerely, Brown. Ha ha ha. Cows, isn't that funny? <laughs> Another time, the cows type. <laughs> Dear Farmer Brown, Please change our typewriter for for electric blankets. Leave them outside the barn door and we will send Duck over with the typewriter. Sincerely, the cows. Another reason Click Clack Moo Cows That Type is a very funny book is because the cows use the duck as a messenger. For example, the cows use the duck to get their letters from the barn to Farmer Brown's for, to Farmer Brown's house. Another part I think is part Farmer Brown with his own typewriter, of course. Dear cow and hen, there will be no electric blankets. You are cows and hens. I demand eggs and milk. Sincerely, Farmer Brown. To end my opinion, I will say click clack move cows that type illustrated by Betsy Lewis and written by Dorian Cronin is a very funny book. After reading the book Click Clack Moo Cows That Type, you will agree that it is a very funny book. I uh, that you should read Click Clack Moo Cows That Type at the end of the day. Sincerely, Vivon. I am Vivan and I like the Genius Hour in the Alps program because we get to do a fun pot project that because I get to do a fun fun project that I choose. I also like Genius Hour beca because I get to meet new teachers. I also liked Pi Day in the Alps I I liked Pi Day because we got to eat pie. I also liked Pi Day because we got to receive the digits of pi that we memorized in 1978, digits of pi. I like publishing our stories. I like publishing our stories because we got to share them with other people. Thank you. My final student tonight is Eliza, and Eliza is going to share a poem that she wrote, and she also brought a prop for you to look at while she's reciting it. Pinecone by Eliza Harrington. The pinecone, a tiny Christmas tree for little bugs, with little gifts for each, covered in spikes and wonder. Hi, I'm Eliza. And here's something I like about the Alps. A challenge. And it felt like I was learning. When I knew it would be challenging. I wasn't. I wasn't always. Now I always love that part of the day when you. Day when. The introduction to genius culture is where you get to follow your own passions and what interests you. Um, they research a big area from a topic that's interesting. Uh, topics ranged from three printing to dancing to comics to sign language, dinosaurs, and it just goes on and on. Uh, students worked once a week, either in a small group or some students worked by themselves. Um, at the end, they created a project of various degrees, posters, PowerPoints, slideshows. Um, we actually had the 3D printing running and when we were um, geniuses. We presented to parents, to our peers, and to community members. 
Uh, Genius Hour allows for students to apply the higher order thinking skills as well as creative and critical thinking. Genius Hour allowed students to be in control of what they wanted to learn, how they wanted to learn, and what they're passionate about. And to talk a little bit more about Genius Hour, I have a student here to share. Hello, my name is Ray, and uh, I like Genius Hour because you do lots of research on your computer. You use different um, search engines like Google, Scratch Junior, and Discovery Education. Um, you get to pick what topic you get to be in. My topic is Native Americans. Learn Native Americans of different houses and different tribes. My next topic will be China. And here's just a couple of pictures of some Genius Hour presentations. Um, you can see the 3D printers. Um, Bo Ray's is the one of the houses in the corner there that you can see that's his Native American homes. And then we are also going to talk about some opportunities that these um, students have. The current curriculums in each grade level, each uh, grade has done a variety of extension opportunities. And to talk about our first grade ones, I have a student, Arthur, that's going to tell us more. Hi, my name is Arthur. I am in first grade. Some extensions we did were tessellations, solar ovens, world changers, research slash game, publish on the computer, research country, measurement Olympics, Pi Day, and more to come. I was research on our country because we got to type it and add pictures. Uh, I liked Pi Day because we had a competition to memorize the digits of Pi. Who, who had the most wins? I was able to remember 21 digits, and Liam is the CPE record holder with 107 digits of pi. <laughs> I'll just quickly talk about some of the extensions that second are doing. As I mentioned, all of uh, one piece from We also did uh, living students researched a career they to go into and then presented their information some of them in costume some of them with props um, we had a fun day where we celebrated being in second grade called Tuesday um, students each or actually I should say parents each sent in a picture of their child at two so all the students were able to see each what each other looked like at two years old and kind of made a game of it to try to guess like who was at two years old um, and then the other thing that is on the slide there, uh, in our new phonics unit, there are lots of extensions for us to do. And some all videotaping certain um, lessons, I'll say. So students were able to choose a phonics um, convention and make a lesson out of it. So it's been very interesting to see what they, what they show and how great they do at it. So thank you. Hi everyone, my name's Leanne. I'm the third grade ALPS teacher. Some extensions that we do in third grade, a lot of them are project-based learning opportunities. So for example, we just finished our geometry unit in math and to rather than doing a traditional test, we are learning the basics of 3D printing and the students get to apply their knowledge of geometry to the design that they make of a keychain. Um, also unit before area and perimeter so the students read if I built a school and they got to design their own school layout and act an architect and find the area and perimeter of the room or school we connected that also to our opinion right one thing if they were to design a school we had to have and they wrote about that and we also connected it to our science unit and the students were able to build the compound machines that um, construction workers use to buildings of our extensions are also naturally brought up by the student capacities and just the questions that they ask. So for example, we just did our unit on simple and compound machines and all the students had access to that to show them how to build these machines, but no student in our class chose to watch those videos. They decided to be collaborative and be creative and design something on their own, which was really neat to see. 
I also have my third grade Elise here to tell you about some of her favorite extensions that we've done. Hi, my name is Elise Frost and I'm a third grader. One of my favorite extra projects that we've gotten to do this year was Stanley, was the, was the flat Stanley project. For this project, we got to learn about different places in the United States by sending our flat person to someone we knew. They took pictures with our flat person with things and places that make their location unique. For example, mine went to Charleston, Illinois to visit my aunt's sister. She took, it, she took pictures of it with, um, with the place where the, Link, where the Lincoln-Douglas debate took place and with Abraham Lincoln's dad's log cabin. This connected to our, to our How We Organize Ourselves unit because we learned about natural and human characteristics in Michigan versus other places. My other favorite was our pen pals. We learned how to write and address letters and we sent them to the third graders at the Saginaw Chippewa Academy. We learned about Native American history in Michigan, and we connected it, and we connected it to the American culture now. We sent, letters, we sent letters back and forth, and we were going to visit them for their cultural day. I'm really glad I'm in the Elvis program because we get to do extra projects that we might not have time to do if we were in other classes. And we also get to do extra celebrations in these. For example, last week we celebrated Pi Day. We did fun pie-related crafts and tried to memorize some digits of pie. Thank you for listening. Hi, my name is Melanie. I'm the fourth grade teacher at Alps. Um, some of the projects that we have been doing landform projects where students get their own landforms um, around the world and study and research and they got to present it in any way that they wanted to. I had some do Canva presentations, point presentations. They got creative and they had a lot of fun with it. Um, another thing that we do is data and line plots that we were working on. Students got to break up into different groups and different stations, and they created their own data. And with that data, they l placed them on data, mean, median, mode, range, all of that. And they had a lot of fun hands-on activity with it. Um, a big one that they did was immigration books. They spent a long time studying immigration, the effects of immigration, the push and pull factors, and created their own online book. Many of my students were 25, 30 pages of information. They were very proud of it. And right now what we're working on is economy. So we've kind of, in our classroom, created the board game of life in our own room where there's chances. Um, they get to create their own like jobs, what their own income is, what they want to spend their income in, and how much money they have left over at the end of the month. <laughs> uh, my students did not want to come today, but they wanted me to pass along messages. Um, one student says, I finally get attention in class. Um, for the first time, I'm excited to come to school because I know I'm going to be challenged and not bored. Um, I'm not given busy work just to entertain me for finishing else I get to do actual work. I'm in groups with people at my same level and not have to be kind of the teacher for other kids. I love being with like-minded friends. I'm allowed to go above being called a nerd and, and I've really improved my reading and my research skills. Thank you. Hi, I'm Amanda Laddick, fifth grade. Um, I've got a few examples here. So um, like I think Leanne had said, there are so many natural opportunities. So I just tried to pull some of the things that were specifically different. Um, so one of the first things we did this year was um, I had suggested we record ourselves reading picture books. It went all further than I expected it to. Some of the kids were really excited. And the little ones nicknamed them the talking books. So if you come to the Central Park Library, some of the picture books have QR codes. You can scan them, and a fifth grader will read you the book. Um, and that was a really cute one, and the kids got a kick out of that. We monthly book project, so that kind of came of that. So there's a picture of one of my students and her um, book projects for that month where she made a diorama, and we do a big walkthrough, and everybody gets to see each other's. Um, on the bottom, I put 3D EDU. I actually had a student create his own 3D printing club, which was super exciting. Um, he came to me with it. I had never used a 3D printer before, so it was a great learning opportunity for all of us, and we've been running it all year long. We are in our fourth session. 
So we've now reached, I think, 80 kids and not just ALP students. So it's open to all the fifth graders. I don't lift a finger. He literally leads the entire thing every week. They have lesson plans and all. So that's been really neat to watch him do that um, throughout the year. Um, one of the images, it's hard to see, the one with the exclamation point, one of my students for his informational writing report, in addition to his 13-page document, created a game about his explorer. They were doing um, explorers of the world, and his game, you have to try to collect the coins before you get attacked, or your ship sinks, and you are no longer exploring. <laughs> uh, so the kids just went above and beyond. I, that was nothing required. It was just, what else can you do if you're done with your report? Um, because I tell them in writing, you're never done. So we've got to do something else. And then the last picture um, is an example of exhibition action. So in fifth grade, as PYP schools, we all do exhibitions for me so I've seen a lot of exhibitions and the action that has come out of these students has been above and beyond anything I've ever seen personally and it's been so cool so this particular kiddo is doing an experiment where he's growing bacteria in the classroom all things he's brought in he planned um, it got gross and stinky but <laughs> I think he learned a lot it's been really cool um, to see and then I have the next slides too so I'm um, also going to speak to social emotional well-being. So as you can tell, as teachers, we've really been exploring our students and providing them with the rigorous education they need. And while I've loved seeing how much my students have achieved academically, my favorite part personally is the social growth that occurred in the class. For the first few weeks, it became pretty clear that these students felt comfortable being themselves in the classroom. And I had parent this was the first time they felt like their child had true peers and wasn't being ostracized for being weird or different students in this program don't need to hold back their knowledge for fear of taking over a conversation track from the lesson we often veer far off from the lesson plan because of a student um, expressing a question or an interest in a related topic having these students in one place has allowed me personally to really focus on the importance of being a balanced learner Many of the students in my classroom entered with grade-related or performance-based anxieties and were really worried about grades and how they were doing. So we've been trying to shift the narrative and focus on the joy of learning new things, asking questions, and learning from mistakes. I truly don't think these opportunities would have been happening had they been one of only a few gifted kids in a traditional classroom. On the next slide, I have some testimonials from some of my fifth graders. Um, so I just asked them what is being an Alps Alps has meant a challenge, an escape, a way to push past the monotony of school. Invite, take it. Join Alps, it's the best thing for you. These also have not been edited. This is <laughs> one reason I like Alps is because it makes school a lot less boring. It's very fun, and if you weren't bored in a regular class, you definitely be here. Also, Alps gave me a confidence boost when I got in because I felt like I could do anything. I liked I have not particularly liked in the past. There were so many misbehaving, so we didn't have much, but in my class, kids actually want to learn, so they are better behaved. And last, I've realized that being in Alps has made me feel smarter, and it feels like I'm with some of the best friends I've ever been with. I feel like I'm where I'm meant to be. Thank you greatly to whoever made this group. <laughs> so what's next? We are currently working to identify students of the month last year in grades two through five as an after school program. We had a national uh, evening last week out of the month and are excited to embark on this journey. In addition, the fourth and fifth grade teachers are exploring math a mathematics competition in grades through eight. The goal of math, math is to expose students to mathematical problem solving. Interest-based clubs will continue. This is introduced along with Amanda just mentioned a fifth own three teachers around Thauer will continue to flourish. Thank you for the team to come and share with you this evening. I am extremely proud of our principals, our teachers, and our students. We will all continue to learn and grow, and the future of Alps is bright. Thank you. Okay. I think we have some questions. Um, 
let's be clear about one thing. That was brilliant, guys. That was a wonderful, wonderful presentation. And I think the part of the testimonial from the fifth, from the fifth grade that I liked uh, was meant to be. And I think that applies to a lot of you, if not all of you. Would you guys agree? I love seeing all of you rise to the challenges and want more and want to push yourselves and want to solve problems and want to collaborate. That is just wonderful. And seeing the free thinking and the creativity and the, the sky is the limit for all of you. And, and it's just what a cool program. So I do have one question, um, Elise. <laughs> Since you were asked what if you were going to build a school, what would you absolutely have to have? What did you come up with? I said a greenhouse. Oh, I like it. What did some of your classmates say? Um, other people said a VR room. All right. <laughs> um, I think a few people said like a um, a like a school shop to sell like different pencils and school supplies. Great. And then I'm trying to think of more. I can't remember. Okay, <laughs> that's good. That's good. I'm just looking for a couple examples. Um, one final question I have, and, and board members, I'm, I'm sure will have some. Can can any of your students maybe give us an example of some of the collaboration that you did to solve or address a real world problem? So, I don't remember what unit this was, but um, in, P in PLTW, we were learning about landforms, and we, and we did an experiment where we had to, s where we had to stop water from reaching sources, and I think this is a problem because, like, glaciers melt, because, like, glaciers melt and rivers, like, they get bigger and bigger because mm -hmm. of, like, global cli climate changes, and, like, weather can be a big problem so so we designed like barriers and stuff to help keep the houses safe very nice good job and do we have a student who can who remembers 107 digits pi it's one of the fifth graders oh my goodness that's impressive yes. 78. wow 78 all right Wait, are you going to... How are we going to know? Good thing, I, good thing my dad is going to check it. Because <laughs> my dad's going to check me. Wait, is that is that mom and dad with you? They can come uh, up and yep, stand next to you. Yeah, yep, with the book. <laughs> All right, let's hear it. Okay, we got to hear it. Let's, let's do it. Okay. 3.141. 3.141. 3.141. 3.141. 3.141. 3.141. 3.141. 3.141. 3.141. 3.141. 3.141. 3.141. 3.141. 3.141. 3.141. 3.141. 3.141. 3.141. 3.141. 
five, nine, t two, three, zero, seven, eight, one, six, four, zero, six. Wow. <laughs> Come here. Come here, come here. Down here, to me. Right here, right here, come here. That coolest thing I've seen all day. Come here. That was awesome. Really cool. Well done. I'm sorry. Oh, that, that was that was, time that that. was wonderful. That was great. That's right. Any questions, Any comments? Any other questions? <laughs> okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I think y'all need to come get high fives. <laughs> come on. Come on, everybody gets a high five. Great job, guys. Thank you great so job. much. Good great job. job. Awesome Thank you. Great job. Thanks, Thanks, for Thanks, for Thank you. Thanks for coming, guys. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Nice job. I like that tie. Mike, what do you think our capacity is for the program? What do you think our capa capacity is for the program? Well, you know, I don't know if there's an exact answer on that. I talk a little bit about, to us about it, but uh, um, right now we have, say, you're in there 22 to 24 students per, per grade level. Um, typical class for us at the elementary is about 500, 525. I mean, last year we had 600, but that was think unusual and so uh, you know I don't know if it's 10% or 15% but remember the test multiple test points um, is what they're using to drive mm -hmm. that so. okay we will move on with our request to address the board and first up on the list is Chris Kleiken I'm not doing any pie unless it's something <laughs> beneath. I want to make that very clear Hi, my name is Chris Clicken. I'm here representing the Great Lakes Bay Be Smart team. Joining me tonight are people who support Be Smart, which is a secure gun storage educational program for adults. We are here tonight to ask the Board of Education to endorse a secure gun storage resolution that would then be distributed to the families of MPS students. This resolution could be used as a platform to help educate families about the vital role secure storage plays in keeping our students safe in both our schools and greater community. We would like to thank both Mr. Shero and Mr. Jaster for their continued help in getting the Be Smart message out to MPS families. We gave Mr. Shero the packets that are in front of you and they include several examples of these resolutions. 16 districts have adopted secure gun storage resolutions and so has the Michigan PTA. These districts from Oxford Lansing to Traverse City, they, see, they are seeing the need to assure guns are secure in the homes of their students. Midland Police Chief Ford has been very instrumental in assisting us with our efforts. We are currently working with Resource Officer Hobbs as our educational liaison with the MPS. Chief Ford recently donated nearly 80 gun locks to our program, and with her help, we were able to distribute nearly 100 locks to, to the families who attended Kids Day at the Midland Mall. Every parent that we spoke to was very thankful and supportive. They appreciated our efforts 
a partnership with both MPS and the Midland Police Department. They were very aware that secure gun storage would increase our students' safety. Chief Ford was very pleased with the response that we received and has pledged to give us additional gun locks for future events. Locally, M City of Midland Police Chief Ford and Midland County Prosecuting Attorney J.D. Brooke are among the other statewide organizations who strongly support Be Smart. Our statewide supporters include the Michigan State Police Office of School Safety, Michigan Veterans Affairs Agency, Michigan Elementary and Middle School Principals Association, Michigan Education Association, and as mentioned before, the MPA. MPA has made significant improvements to our safety procedures over the years. I team at Crest Elementary until my retirement. An employee and a school volunteer, I saw the value of parental involvement in our schools. We need their involvement in school safety too regarding secure gun storage. We're asking for the Board of Education support this evening. We are asking that Midland Public Schools join the 16 other districts in our state that have passed secure gun storage resolutions and pass a resolution here too. Thank you for your time. Thank you very much. Thank you. Angie Kelleher. Did I say that right, Angie? Good evening. Welcome. Hi. Thank you. Um, I'm Angie Kelleher. I use she and her pronouns. I have two kids in Midland Public Schools. I'm here today to speak about my disappointment and anger around how MPS administration has handled an event recently. This is my understanding of what happened. Please correct me if I'm wrong on any of this. The DEI committee at Jefferson Middle School has been planning an event, Voices of Our Community, since May 2022. It was for eighth graders, happening during their English class period and their social studies class period. It was a conference format. The students were to pick four sessions out of 14 different sessions with 21 presenters. The presenters were Ernie Carter and Roland Wallace speaking on poetry with Langston Hughes, Li Zhu Lin, A Journey from Rural China to the U.S., Umberin Jamil, Story of a Muslim American, Dao Hai Asian Youth Outreach, of a Chinese American, Dao Hai Black Student Alliance, Life as a Black or Brown Student, Cheryl Barden, American Sign Language, Alexis Costley, English as a Second Language, Marcy Post, The Miracle Field, Karen Dastic and Madison from the Library, Diverse Texts and Literature, Karen Palumbo, Women in Leadership, Dr. Sean Wilson, Disability and Accessibility, Tsune Takawakita, Japanese Baseball, Tony Schwendler, Senior Services, Larry and Cheryl Levy, The Roots of Anti-Semitism, Dr. Gina Wilson, Latino versus Latinx, Amy McDonald from Shelter House, Survivors in Plain Sight, The Children's Grief Center, What Happens When You Lose Someone, Dr. Jennifer Vanette, Whose Stories Do We Tell, Nicole Rickard, Celebrating Neurodiversity. The event was supposed to happen last week. Less than one week before the event, MPS administration decided that the event had to be opt-in. The parents of the students had to sign up they wanted their kids to attend. The event planners had to scram to make permission slips and try to get them home with kids in time. Days before the event, the planners were told that not enough permission slips had been turned in and the event could not happen. The pre presenters were informed them had rearranged their schedules, taken the day off of work, etc., in order to present at the event. The organizers of this event were trying to create a, sen a sense of inclusion and belonging and understanding and open-mindedness for our students. This event was canceled or postponed just like several other events celebrating inclusion and diversity have been canceled or postponed this year, including the event at Dow High and the dance sponsored by the Black Student Alliance at Dow High. We need to do better. Pardon me? Well, I can. I think they're going to want to speak anyway. But yeah. Um, um, so we're going to just put a pin in in the um, request to address the board for a moment. And Mr. Sher was going to bring, I guess, the majority of you who I think are going to talk on the same issue um, up to spin and give you a little background as to what happened and where we are now. Yeah, I, I think um, Angie has most of it, except for that there is a process, and if it occurs 
the meeting started in May of 22, um, approximately 10 days ago was the first I had heard of it. And so we have a, a huge amount of information that's going to be presented into our classrooms that haven't been vetted going through. So I, I simply request it that we be transparent with parents and have them choose to come in, uh, their students to be going to the event. Um, day or so later, Shannon Blazing. Ma'am, if you can't hear, feel free to come up to the front. I, I see you going like this. Like. Okay, sorry, Mike. So Shannon Blazy made the uh, decision to postpone in order to get larger participants. As of today, I've heard that there are as many as 230 of the 300 students' parents have chosen to opt them in. So looks like very good tra um, transparency to the parents seem to have worked. Um, Opt-in doesn't have to occur, but we certainly have to vet what goes on in the classroom. Ironically, um, after we all had a discussion just last week, um, in the morning I get headline news about school events, and I'm reading through the events um, in the state in a school district like ours, Bloomfield Hills, had an incident where programs similar to the one script and caused a little bit of a disruption. Hence why vetting of materials need to go. So Penny and I have talked about process break what we can do differently in order for if we're going to bring in outside materials into our classrooms we have responsibility to vet what's being in there um, and so with 10 days to go it simply was not possible and so i made a decision to have an opt-in clause for the parents nothing more than that but it has it's been it's not postponed. postponed the event has been postponed it has not been canceled right so i'm reading in a classroom in two weeks because i had to cancel today because of my grandfather's funeral but i canceled today okay okay all right okay we will continue thank you mike for the update um nikita murray Hi, Nikita, thanks for joining us. So thank you for the opportunity to address you this evening. No, I am not going to speak on that specific subject, but I am going to talk about the topic of inclusion and equity within our community and specifically within our school system. I come to you as a person with many intersecting identities, and I know we get a bit of when we hear that word today. Um, but largely due to more rhetoric than anything that's real because we all have intersecting identities. I'm a worker, a daughter, an advocate, an educator, a therapist. You all have different identities as well. But one of my most important identities is that of a leader. Much like many of you, I've been in the incubator before I got into my leader space, my leadership shoes. I know you all as leaders, I was in Leadership Midland with the great uh, attorney Lauterbach. <laughs> um, so we've all had that experience, right? We've all stood in that space. And so as I've watched you and know you to be leaders, I'm here to ask you as a community member and as a fellow leader to be the model of leadership that we need right now for our community in terms of creating a space for students and employees that is safe, that's equitable, that's inclusive, and where people can be the best of who they are and know that will happen without last minute cancellations and pauses on growth and development. I've spoken in classes before in Midland. I said I wasn't gonna talk about that. But um, <laughs> I've spoken in classes in Midland. This is not a new thing and um, some of you were in some of those classes, had children who were in those classes. And it looks like to me, you emerged unscathed. So I'm imagining that the same would be the case now. What I'm gonna ask you to do though is, when you think about the school culture, make sure that we're providing the opportunity like the one we saw so very well just a few minutes ago. Like that's the best of what it looks like when you're in a space where you're safe to be who you want and 
desire to, to be in your imagination is allowed to grow as much as it can grow. And that's what we're asking for. So be leaders and provide us all with the gift of diversity. That's what it looks like. Thank you. Matt Buchek. Good evening. Hello, thanks for having me, Matt Buchek. Uh, I don't disagree with anything you had to say there, by the way, but this month, parents or guardians were able to opt in their children to an eighth grade middle school DEI Voices of Our Community event. Pretty obvious to parents, to presenters and topics, that around half were inappropriately conditioning our children with critical theory Marxist ideals. Fortunately, parents stood up and enough did not opt in hey, their children to attend such garbage. The event was postponed. Do you know why I use these terms so boldly? I use these terms because our children were coming home and telling their parents that they would be called racist if they did not attend. This is Marxist strategy. Do you see a problem here? I'm calling for the board to end cultural terrorism that you've installed in the school system. Cultural terrorism is not my term. It is not a conspiracy. That's direct from Hungarian Marxist Gerig Lukács. His words, self same goal was to eliminate Western culture so that could lead to communist revolution. By ending Christian sexual morals, he was determined to undermine the family to bring about this revolution. Do you know why he was revered? because he went after the children, implementing abhorrent sexual teachings at school, undermining util unity of family, attempting to an army of Marxists to bring the, about the rev revolution. It was 1919, and at the time, Western culture was underestimated by the Marxists in the field. Today, with this board and administration, it's clear to me that they think they now win. Labeling people as Racist, sexist, homophobic, transphobic is relatively new in our language and invented by the Marxists. Today, we'd be absurd, it'd be absurdly rare to correctly label anyone by their terms. The Marxist idol, Herbert Marcuse, used Freudian psychology to apply polymorphism His ideas are widely confusion and are labeling anyone, especially Christians, the selected phobic term for not supporting the abuse of the children. DEI is critical theory. With critical theory, it does not specifically define what it is. The Marxists leave it intentionally broad. It, it criticizes opponents, creates victimhood mentality, and I have continually told you guys that it needs to be evaluated and stopped if it doesn't meet specific criteria. Instead, you continue to put our children in American culture at risk. I assume that not all of you are Marxist sympathizers, so you must be disengaged to what is occurring under your nose for which I ask you to resign, and I'd be happy to be appointed in your place. Thank you. <laughs> Welcome, Mr. Jamil. Thank you for joining us. I moved to Midland with my husband and one-year-old in November of 2000. The transition from Houston, Texas to Midland, Michigan was not an easy one. The Muslim community in Midland was sparse, to say the least. There was no mosque in town, so we hosted events in our basement and drove to the Saginaw Islamic Center when we craved the presence of a larger community. Ten months after moving here, our country was shook by the horrific events of 9-11. Muslims suffered in multiple ways during this ugly attack. Innocent Muslims died, along with thousands of others. To make it worse, the larger Muslim community in America, innocent bystanders like myself, had to endlessly apologize for this crime. 9-11 changed the world for all of us. The change for American Muslims was not a good one. It gave new life to what we now know as Islamophobia. The entire Muslim community in this country was put on trial for a crime we did not commit, certainly did not condone. Fast forward to 2023. I've been an MPS parent for 18 years. I've worked happily, diligently, enthusiastically, tirelessly, and endlessly to foster relationships and give back to the school district. I've tried my best to foster a deep understanding of Muslims and Islam. Why do I do it? I do it because it's through fostering the relationship we create a better community here in Midland. I do it because I want all Muslim children to feel accepted and safe in their classrooms. 
I do it because I don't want non-Muslim children to fear someone that may look different than them. I do it because at the end of the day, our differences should be celebrated and not be used to alienate the minority. The Jefferson DEI community understands the importance of listening and learning from the voices in our community. The admin's directive to make this event opt-in is heartbreaking. Community is not something you opt into. Learning about the experiences of people different from us is how we build relationships and strengthen relationships. It's how we fight ignorance and fear and build community. It's how we ensure that kids like mine have a safe space in school. Admi MPS admin making this event opt-in was a slap in the face to each and every presenter for the event. It was a slap in the face to my child. On paper, we use the right words. We say lead with respect, trust, and courage. MPS admin did none of that when it chose to make the event opt-in. That is not courage. Courage means we support our staff DEI initiatives. Courage means we go out of our ways to make sure that all students belonging to a marginalized and minority group feel safe. Courage means we are proactive in creating a healthy environment of learning and understanding. We say collaborative and inclusive culture. We don't create an inclusive culture when we say to students that they don't need to listen to diverse voices in their community. Today has been a tale of two school districts for me. In the morning, I spent an hour, 48 seventh graders in middle school, sharing with them about my faith and life as an American Muslim. Merrill School District is 93% white. It's safe to say most students have never met a Muslim. And here I am in the evening, speaking at this meeting, having to convince my Mr. own Neal. school district about the importance of our children hearing and learning from diverse voices in our community. Mr. There's so much to say. Time is short, and honestly, I'm tired. One step forward, a million steps back. Thank you. Thank you. Better Sorry. Three minutes. It, it is to everybody. Larry Levy. Okay, I'm Larry Levy. I was one of the people who was going to present at that Voices. Several decades ago at Delta College, I had an intelligent freshman student in an honors writing class, a conservative Christian whose neighbors were equally conservative Christians. She had homeschooled her five sons until they enrolled in public middle school, and now she was beginning her own higher education in a public college. She and I worked well together, but she came to me one day troubled by an assignment in her modern poetry class to read a poem she found offensive in its language and subject matter. She had never read anything like it. She wanted my advice. Should she protest to her professor? Should she quit the class? I asked her if she accepted the professor, which she did, at least before this particular assignment. She was silent. I continued with those to provide only information of the world or was college supposed to offer some new way of looking at language, for example, and at poetry about neighborhoods different than the one she already knew best? She could see where I was going. I suggested that she was under no obligation to like this poem or to approve of it. Could she say as much clearly to her classmates and professor? Could she hear their responses to the poem and to her perception of it? But mainly I encouraged her to give more thought to my first question. What is college for? Indeed, what is school for? School encounters difficult subject matter, stuff that is dark or harsh or upsetting, however true, should we opt out? As teachers, should we soften it or avoid it altogether? I think this is the big question here regarding the MPS Voices of Our Community program that was so abruptly, abruptly canceled last Thursday afternoon, postponed, I hope, until mid-April. Before you say, well, Levy's a college teacher, yes, but I have also taught at every level from preschool through grad school. And since moving here in 1977, I have visited over 100 Midland area classrooms at all levels, 
elementary through senior high, mainly to conduct workshops on poetry writing, on the Holocaust, and other subjects. I also participated every year for over a decade with many, many small discussion groups in middle school eighth graders in the forerunner of the Current Voices program, which was then called unapologetically Diversity Day. It was an exceptional program, and I was very pleased when I was invited last September to participate in this new version of the same idea. I applaud the committee that has worked so hard to make this happen. I urge all Jefferson parents to understand that the program is designed for students to have significant choices regarding I'm going to finish. No, you're not. Yes, I Your am. Your time is up. I don't Thank care. You. We can arrange then if you want to do that, you go ahead. Please call me the police department. <laughs> well, I'll tell you, I sat where you sat three for minutes. a long time. Three minutes. And Everybody I don't recall knows anything three like this, the rudeness Sarah. to fellow citizens. You're the one being rude, sir. Three minutes. Oh, hell, three minutes. <laughs> I don't I will three and ten seconds. I will more than you did. Jennifer Vinette. Good enough. Okay. We can hear you. I was going to begin my comments by reminding you what the PYP learning approaches were, but thanks to the Alps, I hoped I don't need to start there. So I will point out that if you didn't know about the program, that's a failure of your communication because there were people in Central Admin who did know. It's not the excuse that you think it is. We need to do better than that. But those PYP learning approaches that you learned, you heard about are beginning in kindergarten, but for some reason by eighth grade, we're not supposed to have these themes as part of our education anymore. That's what the voices of our community was about. It was essentially a great appropriate, who are the people in your neighborhood? I would really love for you, sir, or you to tell me which person on that caused such uproar and offense. The program was already designed to have self-selection built into it, seeing how there were 14 options per class period and students could only choose two per class hour. They had two class hours to choose, meaning four. Four out of 14 options. Actually, more options because whatever. But anyway, they're opting in already. They're already selected choices. John Dewey pointed out a century ago that learning is doing and practical learning is important, and if students are engaged, then they want to learn more. And that's how democracy can function, Dewey believed. The ultimate goal is to create human beings with good judgment who can participate in the community to discover the common good. Rather than encourage this, you did everything in your power to take that opportunity away way and in doing so you did not lead with respect trust and courage you disrespected your teachers and school staff you disrespected your DEI director you disrespected the 21 community members that rearranged our schedules to be there you disrespected the parents and most of all you disrespected the students you did not ensure an equitable collaborative and inclusive environment and you certainly did not aim and enable all to achieve success you failed on all of these aspects of your approaches are going to go out to be their test scores going to be judged a complex world full of people with different lived and it's your job to prepare them the world is not than that, quit making our students small. Next. 
Next is Quinn Van, Z Van Zyl. Quinn, I'm sorry. I'm having a hard time reading how you spelled your last name. Thank you for joining us and welcome. Hello, thank you for the opportunity to speak tonight. I'd like to start by introducing myself. My name is Quinn Van Zyl, and I am an international baccalaureate degree candidate in 11th grade in high school. I transferred to Midland with the goal of having access to more difficult and challenging classes, and Midland Public Schools has not disappointed. Through taking AP Chemistry and AP Biology, I thought that I wanted to go into biochemistry or biotechnology for my career. And having a stronger foundation in sciences in high school definitely helped that. I'm here today to request that IB Organic Chemistry is a class that will be offered at Midland High School for the 2023-2024 school year. We have 23 students that we surveyed in Mr. Yoder's AP Chemistry class, Point Chemistry class, and classes around the building who want to and plan on taking organic chemistry if it is offered. By offering organic chemistry, Midland will be offering more standard level IB courses in the science department, which as of now there are not many choices to choose from for diploma candidates. It will give us a better foundation for the fields that we want to go to in the future. As a high school student, we have already heard the um, reputation that organic chemistry is as a weed out class in college is, and I'm, as I'm sure you know, um, it's easier to learn time. So I believe that taking organic chemistry in high school will help us in, our in succeeding in college and um, in a city such as Dow where we are the Midland chemists, it would definitely be nice to have more <laughs> options to take. Absolutely. So in conclusion, I believe that organic chemistry is a valuable class to offer at Midland High and we would appreciate having it. We have a teacher that can teach it, we have students who are willing and want to take it, and we would really appreciate your help in having it run. Thank you for your time. Thank you. And we will stay with organic chemistry. Rory McGreen? McCubbin. McCubbin, I'm sorry. Rory McCubbin Green. Good evening. Welcome. Yeah. What does the food you eat, the medicine you take when you're sick, and the rubber on your shoes all have in common? These are the things that organic chemistry plays an important role in and that the school district has decided to discontinue to the detriment of its students. My name is Rory McCubbin Green, and I'm a student at Midland High School and invested in our chemistry courses. When we conducted a brief survey at Midland High School, we found that over 20 people want to take organic chemistry in the 23 to 2024 school year. The organic chemistry course in high school had so many opportunities. One of my peers at MHS said that by taking organic chemistry, she was able to secure a summer, a summer internship at MSU. Not only that, but organic chemistry allowed students to explore potential careers and majors and prepare themselves for college. Organic chemistry is prevalent in so many college majors including but not limited to chemical engineering, biotechnology, earth sciences, and medicine. Organic chemistry is a course unlike other courses we currently have in the school district, and I know that many of you have children in our school district or have had. And by taking away organic chemistry, you're not only taking away my opportunities, but their as well. There are dozens of people who want to take organic chemistry, and we're tired of our voices being overlooked. We ask you to make an exception for the coming year. We have the people of this class to run and the qualified teachers. We believe that this course is available to further our education in, in the chemistry field and ask that you let us continue our learning with organic chemistry in the 2023 to 2024 school year. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Isla. Good evening. Welcome. Good evening. Notepad decided to go away. Okay, there we go. Hello, my name is Isla, and I'm making statements about reinstating IB organic chemistry. Many students have family, friends, or neighbors who are chemists or chemical engineers. We live in Midland, the town with Dow Chemical. And we have had role models all throughout our lives in the chemistry industry. 
and IB chemistry allows us the opportunity to, to learn a different field of chemistry than, a, than AP Chem offers and allows us to further our education in such an interesting field. We are asking you to allow us to pursue our passions and our interests, to please let IB organic chemistry run again for this year, because we have a lot of students in the course, but without your help, we'll be unable to. Thank you. Thank you. Isla. 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 Just clarifying question. So you've taken first year chemistry mm -hmm. with Mr. Year, and then AP chemistry, which is a two hour class. It is now one hour class. One hour class, yes. and you're asking for organic chemistry. Yes. So are ever in the past or ever? I would offer currently take, um, did take IB chemistry this year. So it's been a that was able to be an option this year. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah, I can after the meeting as well. In science, that proposal that the board approved again. Uh, 2018, and with that, the intent was to sign that organic chem class. In years, and the science department, who that major change was science uh, under science plus big one class. And so the plan was to say, honestly, uh, I own this one. It was supposed to come off the books, off the course offering guide, uh, more than a year ago. And when we reviewed the document, it simply wasn't removed. So we cleaned up that error this year. That's why it was the course offering guide for 23-24. Okay. Thank you. Sarah Schultz. And welcome. Good evening. Sarah Schultz. I'm a parent of two uh, children at MPS. And I'm here about the Voices program uh, and because whether we call it canceled or postponed, the effect is the same, which is to undermine DEI efforts of our educators and our community members. Um, I'm, the eighth, I'm the parent of an eighth grader at Jefferson. I might be the only one who is a parent of an eighth grader at Jefferson, but I'm also an HR consultant uh, who supports organizations across the country in their efforts to build inclusive work cultures. So I know a couple things about diversity, equity, and inclusion. And I know that the only thing worse than having no DEI initiative is having them and then undermining them. Because having DEI initiatives that don't get carried out, that are performative, that are clearly set up to fail, undermines all efforts for DEI and inclusion work. It demoralizes the pe people doing the work and strengthens the opposition to the work. If you are trying to create an environment where everyone feels safe and can thrive, the way not to do that is exactly what happened at Jefferson last week. My eighth grade son, Danny, is a cisgender white kid who was sad when the event was canceled. And he knows the value of hearing from other people whose identities are different than his. And after last week, I truly wonder if MPS knows that value as well. And if it does, then our leaders need to do the real work, not the for show work of posters and website comments and statements. Clearly not the work of saying yes to an event and creating obstacles to it. The leaders of MPS need to stop making decisions from fear and start making decisions for what's best for all students here. So that's my ask. Stop making decisions from fear. 
Stop listening to that loud minority of Moms for Liberty voices screaming parents' choice against what you know and what your teachers know is best for our students as trained educators. Stop defaulting to the least possible risk and start focusing on the best possible outcome. My second ask is prove it. Prove that this wasn't an effort to undermine DEI. Make, do this by making sure every single DEI initiative from now on happens and is supported and that extra effort given to DEI initiatives and extra care is given clearing obstacles and creating opportunities. I want to believe that my children are in a district that where DEI goes way below the surface and I want my son to believe that too. Thank you. Katie Robel. Hi, Katie, welcome. Uh, Katie Robel, I'm the parent, uh, I'm a tall parent of two children currently in Midland Public Schools. And I came here with plans to speak in alignment with what others have already said. But for the sake of time, I'm gonna kind of cut to the chase. And as a parent, I'm gonna ask the board to provide some clear guidance on what requires an opt-in from my children and the children in this community to learn about. Because right now, it appears that opt-in is reserved for anything that's not rooted in white heteronormative Christian nationalism ideology. And that's not an alignment with our district values and mission. So I come to you today with many others and I ask for clarity and honesty because we don't have time to continue down a performative path. I ask that you avoid using euphemisms such as controversial if you mean black or brown or not Christian. That's all. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Taylor Smith. Hi, Taylor. Welcome. My name is Taylor Smith. I'm an MPS graduate and mom of three MPS students. Mr. Cheryl, when my son was called the N-word 10 plus times at school, he was not given the option to opt in or opt out of that experience. A young man who just transferred schools mid-year because he felt unsafe due to being harassed because of his skin color was not given the option to opt in or opt out of being added to a Snapchat group filled with his classmates Herschel slurs Pine basketball player and taught by Northeast parents and players was not out of that extremely traumatic event and the events that followed due to the behavior of our parents and students. My son's reality is not opt in or opt out. The reality of all marginalized students in this district and those that visit from other districts is not opt in or opt out. How can you plaster the district vision statement on every visible platform that we have and then make the Voices of Our Community event at Jefferson opt in? Creating hurdles to keep this event from happening is in direct opposition to your vision statement. By keeping Ernie Carter, the Shelter House, the Children's Grief Center, and Senior Services, all pillars in this community out of our schools, how are you leading with respect? By keeping the story of an American Muslim, the story of a Chinese American, and the presentation on life as a black and brown student out of our schools, how are you ensuring an equitable culture? By keeping presentations on diverse texts and literature and English as a second language out of our schools, how are you ensuring a collaborative culture? By keeping presentations about the miracle field, accessibility, sign language, and neurodiversity out of our schools, how are you ensuring an inclusive culture? Our children hearing diverse voices is not controversial, it is necessary. You say that Midland Public is committed to creating an equitable, 
An anti-racist system honors and elevates all. Don't talk about it, be about it. Thank you. Thank you. Daniel Segura. Hi, Daniel. Welcome. Thank you. <clears throat> My name is uh, Daniel Segura, or Daniel Segura. I usually use pronouns uh, he, him. I've been an active and engaged MPS parent continuously for 16 years. This administration states that they believe in, quotes, leading with respect, trust, and courage. They ensure an equitable, collaborative, and inclusive culture enabling all to achieve success. I appreciate these words, but only if they're actually lived out. The truth is that we most definitely live in a very diverse community. My kids all have several friends whom English is their first language. Those kids' abilities aren't the same as most of their classmates. Their religion is not Christian, or their skin tone is pale, darker than pale peach. Diversity Day has a long history whereby MPS teachers, family members, and community members presented on topics they've lived, sharing their experiences with students who can learn from them and start to build empathy and understanding. This year's Voices of Our Community and Human Library events at Jefferson and Dow were canceled. Yes, I understand you're hiding behind the balance of canceled versus postponed, I get it. But the fact is that not all the planned speakers are available for the new date. Their events then are canceled. Perspectives brought by Dow High students, MPS parents, MPS teachers, and local community members were canceled. Why? I suspect it's because of a few calls by groups like uh, barely literate Karens for Liberty, who use code words like Western culture to disguise their racism and bigotry. Where is the courage? Where is the commitment to lead respect and trust? Since when is learning about disabilities, the Holocaust, Asian and Latino students' experiences, a topic too controversial for you to embrace and support and commit to yourself. Funny, I don't recall a single opt-in permission in 16 years coming home for Junior Achievement, Veterans Day, Social Studies speakers, or pep assemblies for sports. Those are important. How exactly do pep assemblies fit into the curriculum? They do? Or are they important building the identity with one's school? Sure, whatever. I guess the reason is obvious that there was no permission slip opt-ins because the Karens didn't call about sport pep assemblies, right? Since the theme of the day is your failed leadership and living up to your stated values in the face of a little pushback, here's some more. I demand that every parent receive a permission slip home requiring an opt-in for every sport pep assembly from now on. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, that is the end of the list. Um, I know a number of you have come in once the list was brought to me, so if there's anybody else that would like to address the board, now is the time to do so. Okay, we will close the floor then. Oh, please. Good evening. Good evening. I'm Shauna Patterson Stevens, she, hers. And uh, I have two kiddos in Midland Public Schools as well. The only thing I have to add, I think because of my positionality, maybe because of my understanding of different lived experiences, I'm the person that gets called when it doesn't go right in the schools in Midland, Saginaw, Lansing, and Mount Pleasant, often. So I'm dealing with all of these issues independently. I work with DeAndre, who is, by the way, uh, under-resourced and understaffed. Mm -hmm. So um, what, what I would recommend as someone that's often in your school community is maybe um, expertise that can with developing policy practices that are actually working for the benefit of the students, and I'm, I'm happy to assist. I do it all the time. I'm actually at least one with this to mitigate some of the issues that are happening. Now I know that um, sometimes things happen in the schools and we can't control. I can't control my kids. 
Y'all a little too right there chewing the gum. Yeah, I see y'all. <laughs> but what we can do when things happen and don't go well in the schools is have a plan and work together to make sure that we're offsetting some of the behaviors that are occurring in the schools. So my expectation isn't that we hamper down on our kids. Um, I want them to develop and grow like those little kiddos that were telling all the stories. They were amazing. Um, when things don't go well, let's have some policies and practices in place. And I'm happy to help. Thanks. Thank you. Anybody else? Yes, ma'am. Hi, my name is Elena Smith. I use she, her pronouns. Um, I wasn't planning to speak, but I just want to touch um, on a minute. Um, I went to Midland Public Schools. My sister went to Midland Public Schools. Um, we ended up uh, moving to Coleman Schools, which I realize is not in your purview, but it's, it's a neighboring community where there's where <laughs> kids from Midland County live. At Midland School, at, um, at Coleman Schools, my sister is um, part, part Russian and part Chinese, was bullied daily, daily for the way she looked. She was called a Russian spy. She was told that she had squinty, silly eyes. She was told, why aren't you good in math? You're Asian. She was called T-Rex because she has bilateral brachial plexus. She was physically hurt by other kids. She was emotionally hurt by other kids. It resulted in her dropping out of high school, in her deciding that she didn't want to take her full ride scholarship, that she had to college. She instead dropped out of high school. Those are real effects that are happening to students in our communities because they do not feel safe in schools. So it's not just, oh, the kids might not feel as good. No, there's real life altering effects that are happening as a result of what is, what is happening in our schools. And hopefully my is that with more presentations put on by the DEI um, facilitator and more presentations like the ones that have been promoted tonight, that those changes can those changes can occur slowly, little bit by little bit, to make our schools safer for children to go to school, to get an education, to be able to move forward in their life and feel accepted by their community. Thank you. Thank you. OK, last call. Floor is closed. Thank you very much. All right, moving on, we're at item five, curriculum instruction and assessment. Item 5.1, we have minutes from a committee meeting and on February 20th, which will be read by Brad, because Ms. Baker is not here. All right, we had a curriculum instruction and assessment study committee minutes from February 20th. Members present, Lynn Baker, Chair, Brad Blazy, Jennifer Ringgold, Penny Miller-Nelson, and Mike Charo. Guests were Jen Service, Tracy Speaker, Gerstheimer and Kara Stark. Meeting location elementary. So we did get a first hand to see all the guys before you did. <laughs> Diversity, equity, inclusion update. The Dow High Human Library event has been rescheduled for April for the February 17th Professional Learning Day. All secondary teachers participated in a diversity, equity, and inclusion focused workshop. Then the winter benchmark assessment data report. The winter benchmark assessment data was presented and is posted on the district website. Sixth grade advanced learning program. Tracy Speaker Gerstheimer shared information about the advanced learning program that will be available to grade ALPS students as they transition to sixth grade 2023. Advanced learning program ALPS update. Kara Stark and Jen provided a status update about the ALPS program at Central Park and plans for enhancements next school year. Committee members then visited classrooms. So we got to see all those guys in action. On Genius Hour Day. On Genius Hour Day, yes. <laughs> and designing cool. schools. Our next meeting is the 20th. Okay, thank you. Uh, 
That's it for item five. Item six, we have finance facilities and operations starting with 6.1 minutes, which will be by Mr. Lauterbach. Thank you, Scott. Uh, the FFO committee met on March 6th. Uh, the first item on the agenda was a presentation from River Caddis. John McGraw from River Caddis presented a proposed amendment uh, to the study presentation representatives from Barton Mallow and French and Associates presented an overview of the facility study process and discussed possible times. Financials expenses attributed to increased expenses per purchase the administration recommends project and facilities throughout the district. of a concrete repair project and asbestos administration will recommend award to replace replacing at each Dow High, Midland High, and Northeast Middle School. An award for applicable equipment as well. The administration will recommend a building program should 60 funding from the ESA. Bond sale offering resolution. The committee was reminded that Series 3 of the 2015 will be sold on March 14th. The ratifying resolution will be presented at the March Board of Education meeting. The next April meeting, um, this says, will be April 3rd. I think to uh, an email to reschedule that to April 10th. That's correct. That correct? Yeah, we're okay, still waiting so on one to confirm that, but that's correct, sir. Okay, so the uh, looks like the April the uh, FFO meeting will be April 10th at 5 p.m. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, next up is the first of, I think, eight or so action items. Uh, this is the 2022-23 budget amendment number one. Mr. Brute. Yep, thank you, President McFarland. I appreciate the opportunity to present this budget adjustment to you this evening. Um, we start with our first slide, which is a review of what our budget timeline is. This is the time of year where we are overlapping on developing next year's budget, but also refining and adjusting what our year budget is as well too. Um, unfortunately for you all, you'll have to hear me a lot at the next couple of weeks. Um, I host your budget workshop in April and we do start that at 6.30 so we can have that discussion. The intention of that budget workshop is to give you a preview of what next year is looking like as well as a review of the district's current financial status. In the you the 23-24 budget that will also be our truth in taxation hearing and then finally I will come back to you on June the 19th I will propose to you a second revision of this 22-23 budget and also we will have the final vote for the 23-24 budget so there's a snapshot of what our annual is so this evening uh, I really want to focus in on the word that is italicized in red and that's that's time in state funding information as a review, we present our budget to you the very first week of June, and when we do that, we have to lock in during mid-May to believe our predictions are. And um, what we found is that while there are certain predictions about foundation allowances that we've gotten better at, the shift to more substantial categoricals has made our life a lot trickier. It was a couple of meetings back where someone had asked me, if there was something we could ask our legislators for, my advice was to give us money in the foundation versus categoricals. You'll see tonight why that's even more evident as well, too. So um, I'll try and not use language as much as I can. I have put those off to the side if that's really what your thing is, but I'll try and do it in real speak um, as I know that I get um, a little bit deep into that pond. So here are the state budget items that were not included in our original budget that have substance to them that are impacting this adjustment this evening. There was a pretty significant shift in they fund special education students. They are funding us now at about 75% of the foundation allowance on top of a regular foundation that we built in. Um, we did receive, thank you very much for your advocacy on this, full at-risk funding for the first time. We did not know that that was actually going to pass in the budget, so that was a substantial adjustment. Mental health funding has come to us in two separate sources. We call those in our world 31AA and 31N6. Student safety we talked about a lot. There were three money. They're all on the 97 budget codes that came to us. Learning loss came to us just recently. That's called 98C. 
and there was also a very substantial retirement fund one-time payment. This was something that you all advocated for as well. Um, the way that the state has had to flow that money through has pushed through districts. So that large lump sum payment was to every single district based on your employee's retirement amount. And so we've had millions that have pushed through MPS that it really is an in-out check to record on our books. Has no impact on us to the good or bad, but it will change your numbers. The other expected unexpected that we had was our venture tax adjustment. That too was also an in out from the state, but that was a couple of million dollars that we had not anticipated. And finally, the salary adjustments that the board voted on, um, the stipends that we gave to all employees, that came out to just around a million dollars as well too, so that was not something that we had anticipated. So with all of that, the further complicating factor in this is the timing of when Midland Public and all districts in the state receive the final information on what those dollar amounts are. So you can see I've scripted out for you a calendar for some of those items that I've talked about on when we've actually received the information and three lines just the final information. We knew that it was coming in specific dollar amounts for us to sign. And this is time for us to stop for just a second, and I do need to recognize some very special employees that we have. We've had to implement what we call the grant planning and implementation team this year. Um, month, that team is made up of Kim Funnel, you met her a meeting or so back, Penny Miller Nelson, John McClellan, and Lori Holderby, and every single time that a new stream of funding has come in, we've had to reallocate those dollars with trying to maximize their on students, trying to ensure that our longevity of these funds will for as long as we possibly can. By moving some of these funds around, the board has been able to make some decisions like paying for IB test coverage, the student breakfast program, new literacy materials, etc. Their um, very careful planning has allowed the board to be able to do some of those very important things this year. So I have to express my gratitude to that team. It's been an abnormally busy year for them due to the flow fiscal information. So when you boil it down, this is just the revenue page. I'm presenting to you this evening a budget that has $15,774,559 in additional revenues coming into Midland Public. You can see those detailed, um, any significant revenue expended over 300, excuse me, significant revenue over 400,000 is listed. Just to talk about a couple of the very significant ones. If you see at the top, that one-time retirement payment. That is how the state is, again, pushing that retirement fund through the district. They sent us the dollars. We turn around and write a check and send it right back to the state, but we have to book it as a revenue and expenditure. The same is true with what you see in the next line, about $2.7 million. That was largely comprised of our Midland Corporation Venture tax investment. Again, the state sent us the money. We sent it over um, to Midland Co-Generation Venture. It was really an in-out, but we have to. You'll see other line items that um, directly reflect what I talked about in the previous slide. Um, increased special education funding, increased mental health funding, increase in your at-risk funding, your school safety lines, your title funds, all reflecting the actual revenues that came into the district this year. The other side of that is significant expenditure changes, and I am presenting expenditure changes that total $15.2 million, $15,173,795. Back, you'll see some corresponding line items. You'll see our tax payment, you'll see our retirement fund payment directly at the top. Those were in out dollars. You'll see that we allocated those mental health dollars to be able to do what they're supposed to be doing. You saw those presentations on social emotional learning. Um, we have put our increased at risk funding to good use and are getting those dollars um, directly into the hands that can impact student achievement. Our student, our school safety dollars, you remember approving the Evolve systems. Jeff has also facilitated critical incident mapping as well too with those dollars. And you will see our staff stipends, which I said just came in um, under a million dollars, nine hundred ninety-six thousand ninety-five to be exact. Our increased title funds, eleven T funds, which were S or equity, and some learning loss dollars as well too. 
When you crunch all of these numbers together, you can get a little bit lost in this table. Um, but I'll take you directly down the middle column um, to show you what the overall impact is. When you're adding $15.7 million in revenues, that's our expected revenues for the year at about $110 million, just a little bit like that. When you're adding $15.1 million in expenditures, that now puts us up to around $100 and almost $15 million in expenditures. Um, this has decreased our deficit from time of adoption by about $600,000, but when you are significantly moving our expenditure line, our variance is now impacted. We predict each and every single year we're going to have budget variance. Our budget variance has been around. If you looking at our percent budget, million dollars. So we're really getting up into higher figures. That now means that we're to that we are on balance to balance this. If you're 3% because I know some of my significant payments in out have been direct. The variance will be on my staff stock. So there's some variables that I'm firm on that in the past when you don't have those big of numbers being unknown expenditures by the end of the year, that that leads to those higher variances. I'm guessing 2% is probably right about in the wheelhouse of where we'll come out to. So if all of those numbers hold true, which they will continue to adjust as the year goes on, um, this presentation is actually outdated. We just got a memo last week from the MDE that we got an additional $71,000 in another categorical um, for supply chain assistance, which will again impact the next budget um, adjustment that we do as well. We now um, are predicting that we this year a general fund balance um, just north of 28 million, 28,292,306 to be exact, which would give you, um, if it were completely true, a fund balance percentage of around 24.7%. I do also want to point out, and I've repeated this before, if we do come in perfectly balanced at zero and still have the same $30 million in fund equity reserve that we have right now, you will see a drop in your fund balance percentage because you are now dividing the larger expenditure line. It doesn't mean that anything negative has happened. It's simply a reflection of a surge in expenditures because of one-time revenue and one-time expenditures, which will be a conversation that the board and the superintendent will have to have at a certain point in time because a lot of our formulas for salary increases are dependent upon that number, which is a touch artificially inflated this year. That's something that we're seeing coming down the pike. So with that said, um, we are, again, in the cycle of working on both budgets simultaneously. We will continue to refine your 22-23 budget for you, and we will bring to you on June 19th our very final prediction on what this year's budget will look like. And for 23-24, last week we met with 17 um, different entities, buildings and departments to start building the building blocks of our next year. We've already seen the governor's budget, which looks to be favorable for us at this time, but we have not yet seen a House or a Senate budget, and we will continue to track those and try and bring um, accurate revenue and expenditure estimates to you our June Board of Education meetings. Yeah, we're over on students, so I don't, don't have a budget by June 30th, but Thursday, and so with that, um, I'll happily entertain any questions that you might have about this adjustment. No questions about this adjustment. As we move towards April in the budget workshop, is it a lot of work to present us with like a, a budget where we would see the same funding streams and same expenditures year over year and back out those one time in and outs? Just so we can see, because like when I looked at your chart, the first, second, and fifth line item don't affect our classrooms right on the major changes so just thinking thinking ahead to next month is it reasonable to ask for kind of the 
set aside of those in and out so that we can see what our classrooms are actually being affected year after year? Yeah, for sure. Um, the context of this is to present to you what the major changes were up in this budget. Right. Um, yep. For the lines that are there. If you're asking for us, actually, I know exactly what you're looking for. Um, in the actual June budget presentation, we do a. Um, Yeah, I have the state bulletin for you, and it, I actually have a percentage breakdown of what percentages go into the different support areas. So I'll make sure that I include something along those lines for you, Phil. Okay, thank you. Yep, so no you problem. Yep. Yeah. Okay, any other questions? All right, I will accept the motion for item 6.2. Move to approve the 2023 budget. Item 6.2. Support. Motion by Mr. Roush. Support by Mr. Lauterbach. Any additional discussion? All in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Okay, motion carries. Next item, item 6.3. This is the carpet placement. Mr. Bruton. Thank you. Uh, bids have been accepted. A tabulation is provided in your board packet for carpet replacement at various MPS schools. Areas receiving new carpet will include. Spaces at H.H. Dow High, Midland High, and Northeast Middle School. We recommend issuing a purchase order to Pinnacle Design of Saginaw, Michigan for $72,270 for this carpet replacement. If that has approval this evening, bond funds will be utilized for the purchase. Thank you. 6.3. We have a motion to approve item 6.3, carpet replacement. Support. Okay, motion by Mr. Roush, support by Mr. Lauterbach. Any discussion for item 6.3? How many participants? I forgot. I think there are only two. Only two. Um, several were invited this time, including local. I think, I don't know if they're named that one, but one local walked in and did not bid it. It's pretty small. Yep. Two, two locals did, walked in and didn't bid it. That's right. Two of them. And two, two of those that walked bid. Yeah. It's pretty small, and I think when they looked at type of carpet it's not something that they thought they could get into Phil try shutting your mic off yeah. it's up, I think it was <laughs> and, and pinnacle is local ish right so local ish yeah second so I know had that written yeah. any additional discussion all in favor say aye aye, aye. aye. opposed motion carries thank you Next up, item 6.4, this is the asbestos abatement. Mr. Thank Bruton. you. Yep, uh, related to that carpeting project, there is some asbestos removal that is needed, um, specifically at Midland High and Northeast Middle School to be able to commence with that car carpeting project. We also sought bids on that, and we are recommending issuing a purchase order to Quality Environmental Services of Beaverton, Michigan, for a grand total of $30,100. This would also come from Series 2 bond funds if approved this evening. Thank you. I'll accept the motion for item 6.4. Make a motion to approve the asbestos abatement in item 6.4. Support. Motion by Mr. Roush, support by Mr. Lauterbach. Any additional discussion for item 6.4? All in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carries. Thank you. Next up, item 6.5, the bleacher painting bid. Mr. Bruton. Thank you. Uh, we also requested bids and, rep and placed in your board packet a tabulation for bleacher painting at various athletic facilities. Areas that will be receiving work include Dow High, Midland High, and Jefferson Middle School. We recommend issuing this purchase order to River of Granville, Michigan for an amount of $166,492. If approved, Series 2 bond funds will be utilized for this project. Thank you. I will make the motion for item 6.5. Uh, 6.5, awarding the uh, bleacher bid to River Town Painting. Motion by Mr. Lauterbach, support by Ms. Ringold. Any further discussion regarding 6.5? All in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Okay, motion carries. Thank you. Next up, item 6.6, .6, this is concrete repair bid. Mr. Bruton. Thank you. 
We also sought bids for concrete repair work throughout the district, specifically areas including the maintenance and transportation building, grounds, HH Dow High, Plymouth, Carpenter, Northeast, Adams, and Woodcraft. We recommend issuing that purchase to KMI Road Maintenance in Michigan for a grand total of $82,683.48. This again will be paid for by Series 2 bond funds if approved this evening. Thank you. I will accept the motion for item 6.6. Move the adoption of item 6.6 awarding the bid for concrete repair to KMI Road Maintenance. Support. Motion by Mr. Lauterbach, support by Ms. Ringgold. Any further discussion regarding 6.6? Hey, just a note. Like for sidewalks, that may be city sidewalks. No. No. Even the, one, the ones at Plymouth? Yeah, the ones we're, we're, we do are all ours. Okay. Some of them are curbs as well as sidewalks. Okay. A lot of cutout patch, a lot of cutout patch through this curb. All right, maybe I, I was looking at the Plymouth. But no. I mentioned I Illinois think City will pick up half of it. So. Yeah, I think there's some debate back and forth, and we now have a map of what's ours and what's theirs. Okay. I'm not sure who won on that, but that's <laughs> now have an agreement. Okay. Okay. All in favor say aye. aye. Motion carries. Thank you. Next up, item 6.7. This is the River Cat Purchase Agreement Addendum. Mr. Brewer. Or Mr. That, Cheryl. That's one's probably more me. I okay. More so we've kept you up to date that they're, they're uh, asking for their current agreement to be amended. And then basically, to sum it up, is they're asking um, to go from a closing date of July 30th, 22, to July 30th of 23. Um, it's in regards to making the project financially feasible for them to actually do. So the delay, I think, is good. And for us, I think we mow the lawn, and there's not much risk for us there. Okay. Thank you. I will accept the motion for item 6.7. Make a motion to approve the River Caddis Purchase Agreement Amendment. Any support for item 6.7? But I, I, I just want to clarify, Mike, I, th I thought you Did said that, it, that it, you were extending it to July of 23. We're actually extending it to July of 24. Yeah, you're right. Yeah. Thank so you. it's not, we're giving them an extra to get their due diligence I was off of you. completed. Yeah. 22 yeah. to 23. Thank you for the correction. Okay. We have our correcting of 24. Any discussion? Favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Okay. Motion carries. Thank you. Uh, next up, item 6.8. This is a Series 3 bond sale resolution. Me. Mr. Sheriff. Yep. So if you recall at our January 9th Board of Education meeting that you adopted a resolution to authorize the sale of those bonds, that which occurred last week on March 14th, the sale of, uh, at that time, $8,310,000. Um, we did extremely well, as well as they've seen a long time. Banking news of that weekend um, had investors racing to secure and high, uh, highly rated bonds. And so we are a very highly rated bond at this point. And we had 10 bids, more than that they've seen, and we have uh, the lowest interest rates they've seen in a while, 2.92, so we did very well. The winning bid was to ratify and affirm this sale tonight. Okay. I'll accept the motion for item 6.8. Move to approve Series 3 bond sale resolution as documented. Remind me, this is the last bond sales of the 2015 issuance. Thank you. Okay, motion by Mr. Rausch, support by Ms. Ringgold. Any additional discussion uh, regarding the bond sale? Item 6.8. All in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carries. Thank you very much. Uh, next up is, and I think our last action item, is the skid steer purchase. Mr. Yes, Bruton. Sir. Um, a couple of meetings back, I presented you um, a equipment purchase that was contingent upon available funding from a source called 61C. This is similar to that. 
where you are authorizing us to make this purchase if that funding becomes available from the ESA. We have an application currently in process, and if it is approved, we would move forward. So we did seek um, the best quote that we could for a skid steer for the building program. Um, we have gotten keys back from the Clark Equipment Company, um, which is West Fargo, North Dakota. The delivering dealer on that is Bobcat. Michiana, which is located in Niles, Michigan. The price for the skid steer that the Building Trades Program would like to purchase is $68,628.26. If that becomes available, we'd like your approval to move forward with that purchase. Okay, thank you. I will accept the motion regarding item 6.9. I move the adoption of item 6.9, awarding the, or approving the skid steer purchase if the uh, funds are available from the ESA uh, from uh, Bobcat of Michiana. Support. Motion by Mr. Rausch. Support by Mr. Lauterbach. I'm sorry, I said that backwards. Motion by Mr. Lauterbach. Support by Mr. Rausch. Any additional discussion regarding 6.9? All in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carries. Thank you very much. All right. Next up, item 6.10, information on gifts. Mr. Thank you for information only this evening, 16 gifts totaling $6,152.86. They include a wide range of items from food service scholarships to numerous classroom mini grants and supports for clubs and athletic teams throughout the district. For our traditional practice, all donors will be acknowledged in the broadcast credits of tonight and also through board correspondence. We appreciate everyone's generosity. Thank you very much. Thank you. Next up, item seven, human resources. Uh, just to note right off the top, there was not a study committee meeting, so there will be no minutes to read. Item 6.1 is information. Mr. Jaster. Thank you. The below staff member announced her retirement with the effective date listed. So Mary Hamilton, longtime paraprofessional at Chestnut Hill, retires effective June 1st, 2023. Um, and I'll jump into 7.2. Please, thank if you. That's all right. Uh, board and staff extend their sympathy to, sympathy to the following family. Uh, Friedhold, also known as Fred Spitka, passed away February 25th, 2023. Fred was head custodian at Jefferson Middle School. He retired from MPS in the year 2000 with 43 years to the district. Wow. Thank you. Okay, item 8.1, we have correspondence to and from the uh, Board of Education. 8.1 is letters to the Board of Education from those individuals outlined in the agenda. Uh, similarly, 8.2 is letters from the Board of Education to individuals and entities also outlined in the agenda. Activities, uh, you'll see in item 9.1, the list of our remaining uh, scheduled meetings for 2023. Please note on April 17th, we have a budget workshop and a regular meeting which will flow together beginning at 6.30 p.m. I think that's the only... No, we do have two meetings in June, June 5th and June 19th. Um, and finally, item 10, our study discussion session 10.1. Are there any points of clarification on any agenda items that were discussed tonight? I have two things. February 4th, um, that presentation asking us to do resolution events. That looks like from a committee standpoint, where does that go after the conversation about that? So, Mr. Chair. Yeah, so that what I would think would fall under um, Student Services or CIA, and we can discuss it there. Um, I think they're, we've been working, Jeff and I have been working with them along the route. Board resolutions, actual formal board resolutions are probably not a good practice because you'll be hit with many, 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 many of them over the years. And so support could come in a different form resolution, and I think we should discuss that in there from a letter of support in a communique or some form of that. And so I don't think there's any reason not to support it. I just am trying to protect you from um, what, what, you, what you saw tonight. And so that's <laughs> partly my job is, is to do that. This, it was painful tonight. Second question, Jen. Um, the second question is in regards to what um, came down tonight. Um, and um, again, having Um, 
behind and so much money that we spend from the district goes towards all these DEI initiatives, all the grants that we've gotten. Um, to have something like that happen just is so disheartening. So what is that, again, as a new board member, where does that come, what committee, what, where do we follow up with that to hold accountable our central admin staff with what we've asked them to do in multiple places? Want me to answer my thoughts? Yes. <clears throat> I think I've asked Penny for this summer to put a review together. Here are all the things they said. A couple of things that I must point out before we're done tonight is I never advocated for a delay or the occur. Never came for me. I understand I'm responsible for everything and I'll take all the beatings that I get many and I'm getting real tired of them because I've stood up and done what we're supposed to do done for it getting pretty impatient on it keep treating leaders like that you're not going to have many the the uh, review needs to occur because times have changed if we like it or not bringing in materials need it doesn't mean it can't it to be a vetting process and most of us do the high school human libraries uh, human libraries were vetted and brought through Penny's curriculum division there was a communication breakdown, and I'm not going to throw people under the bus, that occurred in this process for me to walk in somewhere and discover an event occurring that had been planned maybe for a year. So that threw us behind, for lack of a better word, the date ball to start with. And so Penny and I have discussed the process that needs to be probably this summer. I won't be here long enough for you to be a part of that, but it's time to vet how does materials come into your school today. Outside clubs typically are parents' choice to have their kids participate. During the school day, typically send them to school thinking that all materials in your school and what you put them in front of them through has either been vetted by the MDE or vetted at a local level. Materials, we did not have time to vet the materials to go through that. I'm sure they were fine. But I did share an example with you where it's wrong. So there's a process. That should happen. MPS has many wonderful processes that have been, in, and I think this one needs one as well. So it's CIA because it's curriculum and instruction in front of children. Okay. Mike, I think the floor is yours. Yeah. The, so I was going to mention to be smart. I think there's a way to work with them. I think it's a worthy cause. Great people. They've very, been very good to work with all the way through. Um, I think we're at a point in our society that very few disagree that there should be safe I think we can work on that port portion of it hr i'm gonna give them a little kudos um, um i think we're up to 13 to 15 teachers hired already on the dotted line um so we are way ahead of the trend of even our faster trends in the past doing very well cost me a little bit to get them filled um you know because there's not as many out there but we've been very aggressive and we'll continue to make progress on those pieces of it so we're doing well on hiring and then I'm going to give Brian a little kudos. He's been working with the Michigan Department of Health and Services. Just talked about air purification systems. And I told you the cost and factors of those. And I don't want to get Brian in a pickle, but it may be up to 500 air purification with some backup filters to the district to go into our classrooms and help keep with during the six seasons that we were experiencing. It, probably long term, you're going to have to look at what that means, though, on some I think one that's going to stay in the and they'll get away, but it's a good thing. School year. Thanks, Mike. I'd like to take a motion to adjourn. So moved. Aye. Aye. Okay, we stand adjourned.